Hello, everybody. My name is Rory Fraser McKenzie. I'm ETC's marketing manager for Europe. Um, and welcome to part four of Making the Light Fantastic, uh, an introductory uh, course in lighting design principles with Declan Randall. Um, throughout this, uh, this session, um, please feel free to use the question and answer window on the right hand side of your screen. Um, just type your questions in there and I will either furiously type a response um, as we go along or I will put your question to one side and we'll ask it to Declan at a, a sensible juncture. Um, if you haven't seen part one, two or three so far, that's not a problem. You should be able to follow around, uh, follow along with the content of this session just fine. They are all available on the ETC Study Hall YouTube channel. I'll be posting the links up uh, in a couple of minutes um, so you can watch them at your, your own time uh, anytime you like. But yeah, if you have any questions at all during the session, just type them in and uh, I will do my best to, to keep up with them. Declan, over to you. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, hello everybody, good morning um, for those people joining us from all around the world. Uh, as Rory says, welcome to part four of uh, Making the Light Fantastic. Um, hope you're all settled in. Uh, today's session, we are going to have a look at the sort of building blocks of, of your design and how you take everything that we've looked at so far. So uh, the objectives of lighting design, the controllable properties of light, color, uh, all those sort of things. And we're going to sort of roll them in how you can actually sort of sort of fluff that out into uh, part of your design. So uh, I have a process that I go through when I'm designing, and um, this is largely structured around that. I I'd like to think that it's not too dissimilar from the way that everybody else works, um, but it's it's certainly one approach. Uh, and this is probably a good time to say that um, I'm probably going to refer to uh, actors, and I'm going to use that word as a uh, generic word for whatever performer you're, you're dealing with, whether it's an actor or a musician or a singer or a dancer, whether it's your priest or your pastor, uh, whether it's a live event and it's just somebody at a podium, uh, all the sort of principles apply. Uh, so I'll use the word actor synonymously uh, with any type of you know, performer that you're, that you're dealing with. Uh, and I, you, I probably find I'm going to refer to play or production and that Again, we'll refer to anything, whether it's a, a band, a musical, a dance piece. Uh, it, it's sort of the performance that we're working on. So when I start to build up my design, uh, obviously, I will have spent a fair amount of time going through the script. Uh, I tend to spend about three read throughs, uh, three, three attempts reading through the script. Uh, the first attempt is I just sit down with a cup of coffee, get myself comfortable, and I just read it from beginning to end. Uh, I don't think too much about it, just give it a read, uh, see what the play's about, get a sort of sense of the feel of the mood of the characters of the piece. Uh, and then I kind of sort of put it down and I, and I forget about it for a while, um, assuming I have the luxury of, of time to do that, of course. Uh, and then on the, on the second reading, uh, I'll start to look for the slightly more specific things. So I'll start paying attention to any stage directions that may be in the script. Um, I'll start looking for uh, references in the dialogue, uh, perhaps to weather or, or time of day, because those are all going to be uh, deciding factors as to how I sort of build my rig and how I put things together into the design. Uh, and again, Time permitting, I'll sort of put that down and I'll forget about it. In between all these readings, I've probably had conversations with the rest of the creative team, uh, the director, designers, um, hopefully been into the rehearsal room, had a couple of run throughs, uh, got a sense of how the play is going, reading all the stage management reports that come through. So I'm starting to develop quite a sort of full picture in my mind of, of how this is all going to look and what the look and feel is that we're hoping to achieve. Uh, on the third read through, I start sort of detailing things in. So I start to pay attention to uh, any sort of metaphoric reference that there might be to light in the script, any metaphoric references to color, because uh, those can all steer me in a direction when it comes to making those choices. Um, other things that I'll start doing on the third read through is I'll start marking off places where I think cues could happen. So there's the obvious start of scene, end of scene, uh, or if there's any sort of mood shifts. But I also try and go through it and try and find moments uh, to shift the lighting or try and change the mood. So for instance, if the scene starts early morning, I'll try and pick a point somewhere in that scene where there's perhaps an opportunity to have 
suggested that time has passed uh, so we can start building in all those kind of changes. So once I've got that rough sort of framework, um, I will have had hopefully all the technical drawings from the set designers, all that kind of information's come through. I'm now able to start planning the design. And I tend to work in sort of four stages. And the first stage of my design is going to be my general cover. And what's important for me is to make sure that we can see everybody. That's objective number one, visibility. We need to make sure we can see. The audience wants to be able to see what's going on. The actors need to know that they can be seen because they've been in rehearsals for weeks and weeks. Uh, so that's sort of where I start. I always to make sure my general cover is, is, is sort of as rock solid as it can be uh, before I move on to anything else. And one of the reasons I start with general cover is you never necessarily know how far your equipment is going to stretch. Uh, if you're in a venue that has a limited um, number of fixtures um then obviously you need to plan this quite this quite carefully you may have a big budget to rent stuff in you may not have a big budget to rent stuff in so starting with a general cover at least you know your sort of bases are covered the next thing i then have a look at is i go and have a look at my specials are there any areas that need to be isolated um are there moments that I want to highlight? Are there bits of the set that need a particular sort of treatment? Are there doorways, windows, that sort of thing that, that needs a little bit of sort of uh, extra light added into it that doesn't really sort of fall under uh, the general cover? Once I've got that in, then I'll start looking at any sort of set lighting that needs happening. Uh, for instance, if you're sitting in a box set, you may need to add in some fixtures just to wash the walls to help deal with any shadows that come in. Um, there might be some practicals and things like that that need to be on the set so they'll sort of be built in around this area uh, although if there are practicals of course the set designer is going to expect them to be working so that is quite an important thing to make sure that you do build into the design and uh, the last thing that i then have a look at uh, i have a look at effects so anything that's sort of cherry on the top nice to have not essential won't be make or break but it's something that could just make an extra moment um, and they'll be the last little things that that go in uh, it was one of the questions that came out actually in one of our earlier sessions um, about how you sort of sort of plan to put this together and uh, rory raised a really good point that what he likes to do is make sure your your general cover is done and then if you're really short of equipment pick that one effect pick that one moment in the play that's important and make sure you do something to accent that and, and sort of highlight that moment so let's have a look at breaking down our general cover uh, you may often hear people talking about a three-point general. Uh, the general, obviously, is the general cover, and by that we mean just sort of providing an even wash of light on stage so that can catch the actors no matter where they're moving. And there are a couple of ways you can do this, uh, and one of them is using what we call the three-point general. And it was originally, the idea was originally conceived by a chap called Stanley McCandless uh, way back in 1936, I think I may have that year wrong, so forgive me if I do. Um, but he came up with a principle, in fact, he has a book out or had a book out, it's now out of print, uh, called A Method for Lighting the Stage. And his uh, principle for this was using the front 45 degree angle and a backlight. So what he would do is he would take two lights, elevate one up by 45 degrees and out by 45 degrees, the second one up by 45 and out to the other side per area, and then he would add a backlight into that. This is kind of a really solid base for your stage. Um, and we'll we'll dig into this in a little bit more detail uh, in a second as to how and why this works so well. Um, but if we have our performer, we're assuming we've got our two lights coming in from 45 degrees from the front and a light coming in uh, from behind. Now, one of the reasons this is successful is our second objective of lighting design is revelation of form. So not only do we want to see people, but we want to make them look as good as we possibly can. And thinking back to uh, session two, uh, we were having a look at the lighting angles and a front light from 45 degrees uh, elevated and 45 degrees out to the side is a really flattering angle for the face. It introduces some natural shadow. It gives you good visibility. Uh, and if you add its partner from the other side in a different tint, you really get good shaping on the face. So you're getting excellent visibility and great revelation of form. So straight away, two of your key objectives are in the bag. You've got those. By adding a backlight in, 
what that does is it straight away separates your performer from the background so it adds in the depth it adds in dimensionality so again you're hitting that revelation of form box so it's it's you've really ticked off two big boxes uh, one of your other objectives is mood and mood is uh, something that you would normally introduce through sort of combinations of color and intensity. And if you wanted to use more saturated color, a great way to do that is from the backlight, because obviously that doesn't affect skin tone. And uh, based on the principles of angle of incidence equals angle of reflection, the light coming from the backlight is what bounces out to the audience. That's what they perceive. So it's a great way to get some saturated color, well, not even saturated, but just a color tone. Uh, into your show that the audience will really perceive. So it's a great way to set mood. So I've now killed three of my objectives. I've got visibility, revelation of form, and mood taken care of. Um, one of our other objectives was information. So with the lights in these three positions, I can tell the audience a whole lot of stuff. Depending on the color I choose, the intensities I put them at, I can suggest time of day. I can suggest a direction of the sun. Uh, so straight away, I'm giving people my uh, the, the information objective at the same time. And the last of our objectives, of course, was composition. And using this system, depending on how you balance the areas, which areas are brighter than others, you can actually create some very pleasing looks on stage. So with three lights per acting area, and we'll spend a bit of time on acting areas in a second, you can actually take care of all five of your key objectives quite quickly and easily. So. I find this a really reliable, solid system um, to go in with as your general cover. Another way to attack the three-point general uh, is what we tend to do is we actually sort of lower the angle slightly, and we still come in as a sort of three-point attack. But what we do is it comes more from the side. So we would have a light uh, directly from the side. We'd bring a light 45 degrees to the front and 45 degrees to the back. So you've still got your three-point cover but you're now coming in from slightly lower angles. So you're probably a little bit less than the 45 degree overhead. You might've dropped them down just a little bit. Uh, so you're coming in from the side front, from the side and from the sort of back side angle. So again, you're taking care of your visibility. You're taking care of your sculpting and your revelation of form. Adding in the same matching set from the other side gives you the opportunity to introduce color, mood, tone, information, all those kind of details can sort of layer in. I would probably still add a backlight into this situation um, because I'm a big fan of backlight and because of that great way that it introduces a saturated color appearance to the audience, uh, I find it particularly useful. So those are the two sort of approaches that, that I would take and a lot of them tend to be governed in the style of the production and the sort of design of the production and the space that we happen to be performing in. But as a general rule of thumb, what I will always do is I will always chop my stage up, I'll divide my stage up into a series of acting areas. And uh, this is one graphic uh, that sort of shows that and I'll sort of break them down into downstage right, downstage left, downstage center, mid right, center left, up right, center left. I give myself nine nine areas on stage and for me an acting area is anywhere between two and a half and three meters in diameter uh ooh, so that's between eight and ten feet uh i think in in diameter um so that's sort of how i divide that up so if you're on a big stage you may end up with more than just nine areas uh, but this sort of gives you the idea of how i sort of chop that stage uh, up into bits and then for each acting area I take whichever principle, whichever model I'm planning on using, either the Stanley McCandless three-point general or the, the other three-point attack. I don't think it's sort of really named after anyone. Um, I'd love to take the credit, but I can't, I'm afraid. Um, and then I will allocate that system to each of these acting areas. And then I know that I'm sort of slowly building up my general cover. So if we have a look at... Uh, a different sort of stage layout. Here you can see they've taken six areas across uh, and three areas deep. So it's obviously a much wider, it's either a much wider stage or they want their areas to be slightly smaller. Now, the only problem that I will, the only reservation I would have about using this system is I always try and divide my stage into an odd number of areas. So it'll either be three, five, or seven. Um, and the reason for that is it'll always give me a central area particularly downstage. 
downstage center is probably one of the most important areas on stage. If something important is going to happen, it's probably going to happen downstage center. So it's great to be able to have a system that you can quickly isolate to those areas. Um, and again, this sort of feeds into uh, if you are in a situation where you don't have a lot of gear, if you're sort of slightly limited on your gear, uh, being able to divide your stage into areas that you can isolate quite easily means you're not having to rig additional lights if you need a special in that area. If you needed to isolate to downstage center, uh, and you on this example where you have six areas across, you would either have to add in another light to do that isolation or another pair of lights perhaps to do that isolation, or you would have to have a really broad area covering areas C and D to sort of make that isolation. So I always like to go with an odd number uh, in terms of my acting areas. It just gives me a little bit more flexibility. So this is sort of something slightly closer uh, to where I would end up. I'd probably go five wide across the front and then as it narrows at the back i'd close that down i am losing the central area in the middle but that's probably a calculated risk uh, that you'd probably be okay to do uh, on something like this so if we just come back to our sort of simple example um we can start i put my stage out and this is where i start to sort of allocate fittings and at this point i'm still sketching on a piece of paper i haven't actually sort of committed any symbols to a plan yet. I haven't started stenciling anything in or drawing anything in on CAD. It's all sort of rough sketches and models at this point. So the first thing I'm going to do is add in my first front light for my first area at 45 degrees. And obviously this drawing is not to scale and the position of the lights is not to scale. It's just a reference uh, for myself to see how sort of stuff is going to be laid out. And obviously the first thing I want to do is I want to add in the, the complementary lights that are coming in from the other side. I add that in. And for each area, I'm going to add a backlight into that area. So I now have my downstage right area covered with my three point general. So I want to pull that same system all the way across the front. And there you can see we've added in three front lights from the one side, three front lights from the other and the three backlights coming in from behind. So that's my my first bay uh, taken care of all three acting areas of my first bay, my downstage bay taken care of. And all I do is I just replicate the system as we move up stage. So there you can see we're adding in the same system for uh, the mid stage areas. And then again, the same system for the upstage areas. And you can see quite quickly how the size of the rig starts to increase really, really quickly that as you add in these areas, uh, the number of fixtures you need can actually sort of grow quite quickly. Uh, a lot of this, particularly on the backlight side of things, has been made a lot easier with LED lighting coming in. Um, because before, if I wanted a two or three color wash on stage, that would be two or three fixtures backlight for each area. And you can imagine how quickly that sort of packs out your rig. Whereas now we can compress all that down into one fixture uh, that offers me uh, some form of, of color control. Uh, so again, I've, I could leave it just like this. I'm sort of ready to go. I've got my general cover. I know I can isolate areas. I've got some color control in the backlight. I've got some intensity control, but I would always tend to take it another step and add in some side light as well. And I always like a bit of side light. It gives you really great sculpting uh, and it's a great tool for particularly telling time of day because you can really set quite strong directional sources of light coming in. So I'll allocate some side lighting for the downstage bay. And whether that's on a vertical dance boom or a, a, a dance tree, a lighting tree, or whether those are pipe end fixtures rigged above, uh, that, would, there's, that would depend on the style of the show and the nature of the set and the venue and all those kind of choices. But once I've got those in, again, I take that system and I track it back across all three bays. Uh, and that's sort of my basic general cover. Once I've got that down, I can then start looking at adding in some specials, adding in the effects, uh, adding in any set lighting and any extra sort of treatments uh, that may be needed. So we've kind of become used to from all this sort of exposure to film and TV and, and stuff that we have these days, we've kind of used to the concept of a close up. If the director in a TV or a film wants us to pay attention to something, they just zoom in and focus in on that person. The problem, of course, in theatre is we can't do that because your audience's field of vision 
is the whole stage all the time. So if we want them to focus on something, we have to have another device. We need a mechanism to tell them that that's where they need to look. And for us, that's a special. So, uh, and that could just be something as simple as, uh, you know, raising the intensity of one of the areas on stage and dimming down everything else. It might be a color shift. Uh, there are a number of ways we could do that. Or of course you can add in uh, an additional fixture for a particular effect, for a particular look. So specials can be used to isolate someone if you really need to pull down to something. Uh, a special is a great way to do that. Uh, because your acting areas tend to be quite big and they tend to overlap each other on your general cover, uh, they're often not great for isolating someone. If someone's having a really important moment, uh, it's probably worth adding in uh, a special that will actually do that particular job. And when I say about adding in a special, it doesn't necessarily mean another light for that job. If you have some moving lights in the rig, perhaps it's just repurposing one of the existing moving lights that are available on the rig. Um, it doesn't necessarily just mean a standalone uh, generic fixture. Uh, we can also use specials to emphasize something. If there's a moment that's happening that's important, we want the audience to look at that. Special is a great way to do it. Um, and I guess I'm kind of going to throw a follow spot uh, in, into the sort of category of specials um, because that's exactly what they do. They tell the audience where to look. They highlight the person that's most important on the stage, and that helps to sort of guide our eye. So a uh, follow spot definitely falls into the specials category. Uh, and of course, they can be used to either draw or divert your attention uh, from what's going on on stage. Then I tend to come around and I'll have a look at set lighting. Um, and of course, the pictures I've chosen are both sets that absolutely needed to be lit. Um, so perhaps not the best example to have used. Uh, but this is where once I've got my general cover, once I've got my specials, I know that my core bits of storytelling I've got those in the bag, then I can sort of zoom out and look at everything from a distance. And you can say, OK, where are some holes? What else do we need to add in? Uh, are we adding in some light streaming through the windows? Are we adding in extra lights through doors to suggest there's another room on the outside? Are we just adding in some soft floodlights uh, and battens and things into the rig just to wash the walls to help get rid of any shadows? Um, so they all sort of fall into the set lighting uh, category. Uh, so they sort of nice to have you'll survive without them but it's it's kind of a nice cherry on the top and the last thing i look at uh budget and time and everything else permitting will be our effects and uh effects for me can include sort of things like gobos now you'll know from the previous sessions i'm a big fan of gobos love my gobos i don't think i've ever lit a show that hasn't had gobos in it I also don't think I've ever let a show that hasn't had some green in it somewhere too. Um, but gobos for me are, can be part of effects. That's something that you don't necessarily need, uh, but that is nice to have. And again, all of these are, are sort of ranks that can shift around depending on what you're doing. If, for instance, you were doing uh, a piece that didn't have a set per se, you were in sort of more of a black box environment, uh, then perhaps your effects become slightly more important because now you may need to suggest a window by projecting a gobo, in which case I wouldn't leave that to last. I would kind of sort of pull that up the rank a little bit more. I'd still make sure my general cover was done, uh, but then maybe things like gobos, windows, they start to sort of creep up the list in terms of uh, degrees of importance. Uh, other things, so that can be projected effects, uh, fire, water, rain, um, and again, this a lot of this comes down to the sort of narrative and comes down to the information uh, aspect and how much additional information you feel you need or want to be able to convey to the audience about what's going on. Um, when I started uh, lighting design, all our sort of projected effects tended to be using um, Pani projectors, which were a sort of a high, really, really super expensive uh, projection system, but they had clouds and you could do water and fire and rain and snow and all these kind of things. Um, they were basically the next step up from the old Strand Pattern 252 series, uh, which I think the GAN scam scene machine did a similar kind of thing. Uh, and obviously, a lot of the projection stuff now has all moved on to 
uh, the sort of digital realm of of, of projecting. Um, but it's it's. I like sometimes going back to the old way of doing things because there's something quite quaint about it. There's something quite theatrical uh, about them sort of being sort of slightly less realistic and slightly more stylized. Um, but again, of course, only if that sort of suits uh, the nature of the production. Uh, I mean, for water, for instance, if you want some reflected water, there's nothing to stop you from having a little pan of water backstage and bouncing a light off it and actually getting some real water reflections happening. Um, so there are all sorts of little tricks and, and tips that we can throw in. Uh, strobes are another thing, of course, that tend to come in kind of at the last minute. Uh, obviously, there's a bunch of health and safety concerns attached to working with strobes and to using strobes in an audience. Um, but assuming that all those boxes have been ticked and that you've got the necessary permissions, they, uh, they tend to fall into the effects category for me. Likewise, things like blinders, depending on what you're doing, of course, um, they would sort of pop into this category. And I would also put any atmospheric effects, smoke, uh, haze, fog, um, anything like that that's coming in, that tends to live in this kind of area. Nice to have, uh, hopefully not essential, but of course, if it is an essential effect, then absolutely the rank, it sort of moves up the rank uh, and sort of slots in at, at the appropriate point in the design process. Uh, Rory, is there, are there any questions that we should tackle at this point? Yes, we have some some nice discussions to be having. Um, two that are very kind of vaguely related to each other, so we'll probably lump them together. Um, the first from Jacob, which is, um, what if you don't have enough instruments to do that front 45? And then the second from Bruce, which is, what would you suggest in decision-making criteria for designing with limited resources? Cool. So, uh, yeah, it, it's absolutely possible. A great, great question. Thanks for throwing those out there. Um, it's, it's absolutely possible that uh, you may not end up with enough lights to do a 45 degree from both things. What I would try and always do is, as a first option is at least do my downstage bay uh, like that, if possible, since most of the action is probably going to be downstage, that would give you the most flexibility. Uh, you run into a slight risk of the quality of light changing as people move around on stage. So that is something to bear in mind. Um, but if you can't do the 245s, I would then come in a single uh, a single 45 for each area coming in from the front. Um, and then what I would do is I would add in somewhere, I would try and get a bit of side light just to give a little bit more sculpting because that single light from the front can be a little flattening. So, um, and something that actually works really, really well, believe it or not, is uh, something as simple as a parkan or a Fresnel, something that's really wide, you can cover a lot of space with it, uh, quite low down, just in front of the proscenium, see, just in front of the proscenium, skimming across the front of the stage, that gives you a really good light. So that's only an extra two lights that you need. Um, it could be a profile as well if you have something wide enough. Um, but that'll just come across the front and that gives you that little bit of sort of sculpting and stuff uh, that you're missing. So if you do have to cut down on fixtures, you can absolutely simplify your front light wash. Then just try and find another opportunity somewhere to do quite a broad stroke uh, side light fill uh, just to help lift out some of that depth. I, I can't remember if it's um, in Richard Pilbara or uh, the Francis Reed lighting design books that are uh, very similar. Um, he talks about starting basically with with front straight on 45 and if that's all you have at least you've got visibility and then as you kind of add instruments you can start adding in shaping so it, it is kind of a balance between you know your artistic aims and your resources and you just kind of have to find that compromise um between the two um personally if if i if i was limited to two points my style of lighting design would mean i'd probably knock it slightly off flat on so it's maybe coming at a 30 degree angle. So you're getting a bit more cover and adding one backlight. So I'm getting two points. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a balance with what you have and, and what you have control wise. Um, and you know, what you're trying to achieve in, in the context of you know, the play, the dance, exactly. the, the some, whatever. Some, some, some of that is also dictated by the style of, of, of the piece. You may not need to have full perfect you know, all singing, all dancing cover from the front, in which case you might, it might be okay to have a little bit of shadow coming in from one side. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of as on a sort of show by show basis. Um, 
it, it always I, I, I've read obviously Richard's Richard and Francis's books as well um, and I've also seen some of Richard's lighting plans uh, and Richard likes to do seven lights per area um, he, he pops a light per area for, to cover every angle he does two from the front a back a top and a couple of sides um, where, where, where he, he has he gets the budget he does get the budget so you know that's that's always good um so um, if someone has just kind of added in a, another really valid point with this that mm. that often the number of circuits that you have particularly in small venues yes. um is it, a limiting factor and that's when you start looking into you know pairing up fixtures um or you know having to repatch halfway through if it's a particularly small venue um yeah, so yeah that, that that can be a limiting factor as well absolutely good point um Joseph then kind of asked, uh, have you considered alternating what side of the warm light comes from as you move further upstage? Um, so I kind of countered with it being a bit odd as you move upstage that, that your actors further upstage would look like they're being lit from the opposite direction as downstage. So he's, he's said that you know, in an extreme example where the wash is generally one colour, then the light on stage comes from predominantly one direction, which is why he thought it might be a, a good idea to alternate. Um, but obviously it, it makes it harder to to keep track of things but but anything to add to that declan um not really um i it's 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 always tricky i mean yes i i kind of sort of see see the sort of logic behind that choice i i would personally i would always tend to keep it consistent um and and for, for nothing for no reason other than it helps me with my sort of mental organization of the rig and when i start numbering things that i'll know that it's one two three four uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, and they're all sort of systems coming in from similar sides, have a similar sort of numbering system. Um, so that there's there's a little bit of that that, that sort of creeps into it as well for me. Um, My advice, Joseph, would be to uh, to try it on a show when you've got a lot of time during tech that you can go and recolor everything and recolor repatch everything. it if you don't like it. I mean, again, the, 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 the ideal way, of course, to experiment with that is using some LED on the rig where you can very quickly uh, flip colors around if you need to. I mean, I... In an ideal world, the the forty five the two lights at forty five degrees, you actually double up the pair of lights in each side, so you have a warm and cool coming in from each side. I mean, this is if if you had all singing, all dancing, you know, no no budget limitations, no time constraints, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you would then double up, and they would have a warm and cool coming in from each side, so you could absolutely swap things as you go. Um, again, that's something that has now fallen away with the with with LED, of course, because you can keep your forty five. 245s and just change color directly from the fixture. Um, two other comments that are kind of vaguely related to each other, so I'll, I'll lump them together. And Peggy asks if you could talk about suggestions for, for how you focus the, the 45 degree front lights. Uh, and Misha asks, what are the best types of fixtures for front 45s? Would, would profiles or ellipsoidals be best? Uh, so let's tackle that one first, because that's, um, that's quite an easy answer. Yes. I would tend to always use uh, profiles or ellipsoidals coming in from the front uh, for two reasons. One, because they are capable of projecting a clean beam from a greater distance. There's not a lot of flare and stuff, so you have more control. Plus, with the shutters and things like that, you have a great deal of control over those fixtures, which is what you want. Um, in smaller venues, that may become a Fresnel, may become a PC if they're available. Um, but ideally, my front of house tends to usually be profiles uh, or, or ellipsoid or something that gives you the maximum amount of control over the beam. Um, then to get back to Peggy's question about focusing. So what I tend to do is I, so on my plan, I've divided the stage up into acting areas. When I go into the space to do a focus session, I mark out marks for myself on the stage. I put a center down and depending on how big my acting areas are, I then put a mark on the center for each of those areas, if that makes sense. So I tend to do a um, a center mark, and then I tend to go out by sort of put a two meter mark, a four meter mark, and so on and so on, and I sort of space myself. Uh, and then I line myself up with that. And I tend to normally stand a good half a meter, so a good couple of feet from the edge of the stage, because the actors don't generally come right down to the front. Um, and if they do, if, if their feet lose a little bit of intensity, it's not the end of the world. The key, obviously, is intensity on the face. Uh, so I tend to sort of find a sort of happy medium. I'm not quite center of the acting area, but I'm sort of just front of center of the acting area. Uh, and that's where I'll set the hot spot of the fixture. So I find the center of the beam and that sort of centers to my face. Uh, and then I sort of 
if I need to shutter in or soften the edge on the focus, uh, I tend to do that. Um, and the one thing I like to do is as I've focused light number one, I'll put that at 40% and then I'll bring up light number two. So I've got a bit of a visual reference uh, in terms of overlaps and I can make sure that it's all fine. Uh, and then when they're all focused across, bring them all up. And I tend to just do a little wander across the front of the stage just to make sure that I'm not feeling any obvious dips uh, in, in the light intensity. Um, it's always good. And that's why it's another good reason why it's good to be in the rehearsal room. Meet your company, get familiar with the company, get a sense of how tall your actors are. Um, if you're a particularly tall person and you focus for you, that's probably not too much of a problem. If you're a, if you're a shorter person uh, and your actors are taller than you, you need to bear that in mind um, and tend to make sure that you sort of lift the light up to cover a sort of face that would sit sort of, you know, sort of above yours somewhere uh, and, and set the centre of the beam that way. I'll just um, tag on something that if if you uh, if your front of house fixtures are source for LEDs or colour source spots, um, we sell an accessory that we call the um, the smooth wash diffuser that isn't bought very often, but really should be if you're using it front of house. And it's it's designed to take what is a very, very flat beam from an LED profile and it gives it a cosine distribution. So it gives a bit of a hot spot. And this means that if you focus your front of house wash sharply hard edged on your shutters and you button them up against each other and then you go down and you drop the smooth wash diffuser in and it diffuses it perfectly and you've got a wonderfully even front of house wash that that any uh any novice can focus very very quickly so that's a, a top tip product wise and um, tied into that connor is asking declan how much overlap would you normally recommend when folks at front of house wash <laughs> that's a tricky one um it, 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 it starts to become a sort of a feel thing, but um, it's typically about a 30% overlap, I would say. When you're focusing, uh, you're concerned with something called a beam and a field angle. And if you look in any specifications of a fixture, you'll see in the specifications they'll list, they'll always, normally the angle that's listed will be the beam angle. And sometimes if you're lucky, they'll list the field angle as well. I believe we list both on our specifications, um, but I know that's not for everybody. But basically your beam angle is calculated from the center of the light moving outwards to the point where the intensity of the light from center reaches 50% of what it is at the center. The field angle is then that bit that goes from 50% down to 10% of what it is at the center. And the idea is that you're overlapping your field angles so that all your field angles overlap. So you end up with a consistent light level. So where the drop off from 50 to 10, you overlaying the 250 to 10s on top of each other to bring them back up to the sort of 100% uh, intensity distribution across the beam um, is one way to do it. The other way, like Rory says, if you're using the LEDs, you can actually just do hard shutter cuts and actually cut that cut sort of quite cleanly, quite tightly off against each other and then just diffuse the light. Um, and then you're not you're less concerned about the overlap because the diffusion filter is actually doing that but a calculation work for you uh, the big advantage of, of doing the shutter cuts to each other and then diffusing is it also gives you a single shadow which if you're trying to recreate something quite naturalistic and we're trying to suggest that there's sunlight a single shadow goes a long way to helping sell to the audience that you're actually there's just one sun that's lighting the scene Cool. I think that yeah. that's all for now. Okay. A couple of questions on the specifics of um, those soft focus diffusers that I will um, type answers to as we move on. <laughs> cool. All righty. Uh, moving on. So one of the things that I sort of think about um, when I'm planning the design is what I call motivating light. Uh, what What is the motivating light? What is shedding the light on this scene? And that really is your information objective. Um, so I, when I'm going through the script, I'm looking for this information. And basically, you're motivating light. You're asking yourself, what, if any, is the light source of this scene? Uh, is it natural light? Uh, is it artificial light? What are you actually trying to convince the audience is lighting the scene? And you sort of make your choices based on that. Uh, so, for instance, if we have a scene and somebody sitting and there's a table lamp sitting next to them, that table lamp is our motivating light. We want to convince the audience that the light is coming from that source. So that's our motivating light. That's what's driving the scene. So the first thing we're going to do is our key light, our main light lighting the performer needs to come from the same side 
as that motivating light. And obviously we'd try and match its color. So most sort of table lamps are sort of slightly warmer. Uh, so we tend to bring it out. So that, that guides which side of the stage our warm light is being keyed in from. And then the other side is just sort of fill light. And that's basically what you're saying is, so if our key light is here and that light is lighting the space, the rest of the light is sort of bouncing around the room and that's what's sort of lighting the rest of you. Uh, and that's your fill light. So it's just filling in the shadows, uh, adding, you know, a little bit of light so people are not sort of only lit from one side. Uh, so a lot of those go a long way to help you making your decisions, find your motivating light. If it's daylight, uh, and there's no obvious indication on the set or there's no clear reference to it in the script, that's great because you get to decide which is east and which is west, and you can then set your lights accordingly. If you decide the sun's going to rise on stage left uh, and set on stage right, that's absolutely fine. You have that power to do that, and that steers your color choice, and it steers the choice of uh, where you're going to place your fixtures. Um, I mentioned that when we're sort of going through the script, uh, you're looking for a couple of things. And obviously, a lot of playwrights put some stage directions into the script. And I find stage directions really interesting. Uh, and here's just a really simple one. Uh, lights fade up to reveal Susan sitting alone at the kitchen table. It is early morning. So straight away when I see this, a couple of things leap out to me. The first one is the lights fade up. So there's a clue. The audience wants us to discover the space. They were the playwright, sorry, wants the audience to discover the space. They want a sense of uh, almost anticipation before it starts, and then we reveal to to reveal this uh, tableau. A couple other things that's been uh, important to me. It tells us that it's morning, so that's great. Straight away, there's our information objective, motivating light. We can still start to sort of plan things out a little bit. So that's all useful. And the other useful piece of information in here is the fact that it's early. And early ties into the movement uh, of light. One of our controllable properties of light is movement. And it's a great way to help tell the story. And here they've said it's early. So that's a great chance for us. We can say, OK, it's early morning. And this scene is going to be 20 minutes long. Well, the sun is going to move in that 20 minutes. So there's there's a good opportunity for a mood shift, for an angle change. Uh, so those are a couple of things that are important. And the other key word for me that stands out in that sentence is that word alone. She's sitting alone. And obviously, until I've seen the piece or read the play, I don't necessarily know why she's alone. But chances are there's there's a lot of information in that word. Uh, to me, it suggests someone who's you know written in the stage direction. It suggests that she's alone and she's perhaps sad. It doesn't feel like that sentence for me doesn't say it's a happy alone. Um, that feels slightly more like a sad alone to me. So I look for all those sort of keywords. And uh, what I do is I then pull those back into our objectives and into our controllable properties of light. And I start making choices. So visibility is our first objective. And I need to make sure that I've got lights in there that will let me see her. Now, when I start making these kind of choices, because this moment, this point in the play, we're just revealing her. She hasn't said anything yet. Susan's just there on her own. It's an opening picture. It's a tableau. It's that one chance we get to say to the audience, this is our world that we're creating, and this is the world that you are watching. So visibility doesn't have to, in this instance, necessarily mean face. It just means we need to reveal Susan alone and if possible, we can set the time of day. So revelation of form, we can decide how we want to reveal her. The mood kind of clued in there from the alone. So I would tend to pick colors that are slightly colder um, for this, uh, you know, to help sort of suggest that sense of alone. Um, composition, obviously, we're going to try and make the picture look as, uh, as good as we can. Uh, and then we need to convey bits of information, um, the early morning being the bits that we need to connect. And that's going to be an angle choice and a color choice that will help sell uh, sell those two things. So with those controllable properties, I can sort of feed those into each of the objectives and I can start to make choices about where I want to put lights and uh, how that's going to reveal the scene. So I've got a couple of examples here. So here's the first one. There's Susan. She's alone at the kitchen table. I've got a single source coming in uh, through the back window. Uh, it's not actually lighting her, it's missing her. So what it's doing is it's casting her into silhouette. Again, it's a choice. Um, you know, 
has have we created visibility yeah to a certain extent we have because we've revealed the shape the outline of someone's so we've created a bit of mystery so we're starting to suck our audience into this world and all i need to do then just before she starts speaking is just add a little bit of front light a little bit of soft low there's a little bit of low 45 coming in there just to pick out that face so we haven't changed the feel of the sunlight that's coming into the room we've just added a little bit of a glow uh, onto her for that moment the other option is to really flatten that backlight so that it actually does light her, that it actually does silhouette her. So we start to sort of pick out a little bit more of her in this moment. Um, and again, that suggests something even slightly earlier in the morning because the angle of the sun is much, much lower. Uh, our other choice is if we bring something in from the side and you can see how just changing the angle has changed the whole feel of the scene. Uh, it's our focus on her is now completely different. We're starting to get a little bit of face, uh, which is which is interesting. So we can straight away see we can start to identify. This is a much cooler light source. Uh, so for me, it has a sort of slightly sadder feel, um, and or perhaps a slightly earlier morning feel, or perhaps a more wintry morning feel. Um, in those stage directions, there was no reference to season. So there's nothing to stop me from using season as a metaphor for her uh, sense of for her loneliness uh, and by sort of lowering the color temp, raising the color temperature, sorry, and just getting that light a little bit cooler uh, helps to sort of drive that story forwards. Um, and again, just adding in a little bit of fill light uh, just to sort of catch the face and just add uh, a little bit more. So another option is light coming in from the other side again not really lighting her but what this is doing is for me this highlights the fact that she's alone because what we've done is we've pulled focus onto a onto a part of the table where perhaps we would have assumed somebody used to sit so perhaps this is setting up the fact that maybe somebody has just passed uh and that was sort of their place in the house and that's why she's looking there so straight away we've given the audience a whole lot of information um, just by swapping the angle and determining on what we're lighting. And of course, if that was a, it's probably quite a, looks like quite a light reflective surface, we'd probably get a good amount of bounce coming off of that table and actually still lighting her face, um, probably more so than it looks uh, in this in this rendering. Again, another option is to flatten that angle right down and actually do cast a light uh, onto her. This one for me, though, feels less lonely. I don't get the same sense of loneliness here that I've had from all the others because we're revealing a bit too much of her, I feel, uh, for this moment. But again, it's, it's a sort of personal choice. So we could completely flip it on its head altogether uh, and we could just have a single, uh, a single sort of downlight suggesting that there's sort of a pendant over the table again suggests for me a sense of loneliness it doesn't quite convey the sense of early morning so i'd probably want to add in a little bit of something through one of the windows uh just to ground that scene uh, a little bit more uh we spoke about adding special so here i've taken that top light and i've just kind of closed it right down so now we really have isolated her but what we have done at the same time is we've highlighted that book so now we're telling the audience that's important. There's something there that's going to connect to the rest of the play. Uh, and these are all really simple little changes, but the message that we're sending to the audience, I think, changes quite drastically each time. Uh, and here's a combination again, light coming through window with a little bit of top light on her. So again, highlighting the empty chair, focusing on her with a book in front. We're starting to tell uh, some stories. So Normally what we would do is, of course, it's very unlikely you would just have a single source coming through the window, particularly if we're trying to convince the audience that uh, this is part of a realistic scene. We're starting to get into a bit of realism. So we would have our strong shaft coming in through the window. Uh, and I've added just a little bit of top light in at the top just to sort of fill the space out, uh, just so the audience can reveal a little bit more of the set. But we're keeping the highlight on Susan so they know that that's our point of focus. Uh, and what I would probably do is I'd actually probably take that one step further. I'm not quite sure how clearly this is reading, but I've actually graded the top light a little bit. So it's sort of slightly cooler on the one side, slightly warmer on the other, uh, just to sort of help pull our focus back towards uh, back towards Susan. Um, 
there we go and again same image just i've changed the angle of the light source um but again keeping it fairly warm it's, it's quite a cool source um but it kind of suggests a sort of sense of uh, of sort of early morning um and longing then in this next one i sort of uh changed it up a little bit and i've actually added surprise surprise a little bit of green coming in uh through the window and that's a very pale green if, if anybody knows the color steel green it's lee 728 definitely one of my favorites so here we've got this and again there's a graded sort of shading on the floor from the top lights but 728 is is a, is a natural enough color it's just sort of off white to the green so it suggests something a little bit untoward it suggests something unnatural it's a little bit uncomfortable uh, so again it's it's another choice that you can sort of throw into the mix to help drive that story forwards um and uh, there we go and then I, I i took a little bit of creative license here uh, and I wanted to show you just how drastically you can change this. We're no longer early morning at all. But now just by adding in a dynamic element, I've got a sort of window projection of a gobo coming through. I've now just located her in a really seedy part of town. Maybe there's a horrible nightclub or a bar or something happening outside the window. Um, I hope that that flashing animation was, was visible for everyone. I know it doesn't always read um, all that well. But just a simple change completely changes how you can drive that story forwards um, and it's actually one of my most favorite uh, experiments to do with lighting students as i hang a window on stage uh, and ask them to tell me as many different stories as they can about the space just by changing the way they the light interacts uh, with the window so when you start sort of queuing your show you've made your choices you focused your lights you're now sitting down at the console and you're ready to start sort of putting your cues into the show uh for me generally there are three sort of types of cues or three sort of styles of cues that uh you'd likely to sort of start plumbing in the one is what i would call a sort of punctuation cue uh there are your focus pulls and there are your mood shifts uh, and these are kind of sort of how i sort of map these out when i'm going through the script I sort of, I've got my own sort of form of shorthand and things that I use, but I sort of map them out. I go, here's an important moment. That's a punctuation. Uh, we're going to just pull the focus across to the other side of the stage for this moment. That's your focus pull, or there's about to be a big fight. We're going to change the whole mood of where this is going. That sort of becomes a mood shift. So uh, your punctuation cues are things like your start of scenes, end of scenes, and I'll include blackouts as sort of one of your punctuation cues, whether you fading to blackout or whether it's a snap to black. Um, blackouts for me are kind of like a palette cleanser. Uh, it's kind of, it's, it's a moment where you can just say to the audience, right, here we go. We're wiping that scene done. That was our scene. We're going to just sort of wipe the board clean and we're going to start again. And that for me is what sort of blackout says. Um, so that would be one of your punctuation cues. Obviously anything on a musical accent or a beat, that would be a punctuation. When in terms of your focus pulls, uh, that's either where you're anticipating somebody's entrance. So maybe you want to just glow a little bit of extra light on the door upstage center, just so when they pop in, we can see them straight away. Um, or maybe there's a shift in the action. So the action's moving from a conversation down left to a conversation down right. Uh, so that would be a sort of focus pull. Uh, and then obviously your mood shift is either a change in emotion or a shift in the time of day it can also sort of change the, the, the mood of the piece. Um, and when you're giving, when you're sort of creating these cues and you're talking to your stage manager and they're putting them into the book, um, there are sort of three ways for me that, that you can sort of relay that information to the stage manager. The first is obviously you can give them the, the starting point for that cue. You can say, I want Q12 to start here when they say good morning, for example. So that's the easy way to do it. The other way you can do it is uh, you can say to you, can give your stage manager the completion point uh, for that cue. And that for me tends to be for your focus pools. So I would say, look, this cue needs to be complete by the time John enters upstage center. And then the stage manager will go, okay, well, this scene is a minute and a half and the cue is 35 seconds. So I'm going to call it here. And then they can kind of pop the cues in that way. Probably the trickiest cue to place are your mood shifts. Uh, because what happens is mood shifts generally happen over a slightly longer time. They tend to be slightly more subtle and run for sort of longer periods. And within any crossfade, whether it's a five second crossfade or a five minute crossfade, 
there's something that I call the point of acknowledgement is that moment in the shift of light that your eye actually clocks the change. You go, oh, something's happened. And that on your mood shifts for me is what you're placing. You're trying to place that point of acknowledgement. And that's a slightly trickier thing to do. And that's the one that I find tends to sort of move around most during tech and has its sort of time adjusted the most uh, will be the mood shift. Just so we can try and hit that point of acknowledgement at exactly the right moment in the script where that mood has shifted. Uh, another little thing I want to have a look at, someone always says, oh, how do you talk about lighting and how do you sort of convey your ideas across to directors? Uh, and it is, it is a tricky thing to do because lighting is very much a visual art form. Um, if I say to somebody, I'm going to paint the wall sky blue, Everybody can absolutely picture what that wall is going to look like. If I say to someone, there'll be a sky blue wash of light on stage, most people's eyes tend to glaze over at that point because it's something they can't quite picture. So I always find it good to find as many visual references as you can. When you're trawling the net for whatever it is, whether you're doing research for this production or another, or you're just surfing or something on Facebook, whatever it is, if you see an image that just speaks to you that says something, whether it's a good color combination or whatever it is, just store that somewhere. Have a little folder for yourself somewhere where you just store all these reference images. And that way, when you get round to having conversations with the director, you can say to them, I think I'm looking for a sort of amber glow, something like this kind of color. Or, uh, you know, I think this combination of colors might work well together. And, and here's an example of how I think that could work. Because what you don't want to be is find yourself in a situation in tech where you've had this very clear image in your mind. The director hasn't quite got it, but maybe you thought he had. Uh, and then there's a moment he goes, oh, no, that's really not what I wanted for this for this scene. Uh, I, I had a great conversation once with the director when we were talking about the lighting. And his uh, brief to me was, I want the lighting to feel like the dunes of the desert. So, of course, in my mind, my immediate thing was, oh, well, that's a color reference. He obviously wants it sort of warm and golden and you know, all that sort of thing. And actually, when we dug down a little bit deeper, that was absolutely not what that reference meant at all. What he meant was he wanted the lighting to be constantly changing like the dunes and the desert. He always wanted a shift that nothing was ever completely settled. Um, and again, we could have gone off on two different tangents, but just by having that little bit of conversation, uh, sort of brought it back and helped actually. And actually, it was a, it was a really good brief. I actually found that uh, quite quite a useful uh, instruction. So this was something O A M A was something that uh, my drama teacher taught me at school uh, in the days where I thought I was going to be an actor. Um, and basically, O A M A stands for observe, analyze, memorize and apply and if you were studying if you wanted to be an actor and you were studying you know your character was an older person uh, without being creepy about it you might want to go and observe some old people some older people and see how they move what their mannerisms are try and work out why they move that way commit them to memory and then apply them to your performance and it's kind of the same thing with lighting lighting is all around it, it's everywhere and you know, it's so easy these days. We've all got cameras on us on our phones all the time. If you see something, take a picture, store it away, add into the memory banks. If you're walking through the park and you walk under a tree and there's a lovely sort of dappled light, have a look at it. Is it a soft focus? Is it a hard focus? What color is it? Notice the way that when the wind blows, it's sort of the pattern changes. Sort of have a look at how that's all working. Store it away in the memory banks. And then when you get round to that scene where you have to recreate the sense of being in a park or some dappled light through the tree, you've got a really clear idea in your mind of, of how that uh, all sort of pieces together. Um, so just a couple of little sort of examples here, uh, just to sort of help sell that idea. So for instance, some photographs and then some interpretations of that uh, into a stage space. And uh, that sort of really brings us uh, to the end of part four. So uh, I welcome any questions that you have. Um, while we're doing questions, I'm going to quickly pop up another poll for anyone who didn't get a chance to fill in the poll at the top of the session. I'm going to see if I can get that running now. Um, so bear with me while I try and manage that. Uh, Rory, you got any questions for us? 
Sure. Um, one that really touches on something that you were just saying there, which is from Katie. Um, what if you've assumed something from the script, like Susan was lonely? You base your lighting choices on this, and then the director has made a completely different artistic choice. <laughs> um, oops. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, th th there are some things in there that are still consistent. The fact that it's early morning, um, that probably hasn't changed. So at least some of your decisions will still be valid. Nine times out of 10, the only change between a sort of lonely and a happy feel is going to be intensity and color and probably mostly intensity. So for most things, you'll probably be fine. Um, hopefully you will have seen a rehearsal um, before you get into tech. Hopefully when you start lighting is not your first point of discovery. Um, sometimes it happens that it is, but hopefully you will have caught that in time to be able to make a change. Um, but again, nine times out of 10 directors understand that, you know, it's part of your creative process as well. So for me, a big part of it is if something's gone wrong, put your hand up and go, sorry, completely missed that moment. My fault. Give me two minutes, you know, and let's, let's, let's fix it up or take a note uh, and maybe just tackle it the next morning in the note session. Um, don't, you know, don't, don't be afraid to, to sort of put your hand up and go, sorry, completely missed that. That was me. Uh, I'll fix that um, as as soon as we can. I um I replied in in text that that this is why meetings between creatives are really important, um, and also a really good reason as to why visualizers um, are a useful tool. Um, for lots of people were asking whether that was augmented. Um, I believe that was a capture file, wasn't it? That was a capture file. We did try and um, put that into the into the augmented. Um, which I'll actually pop up on the screen now for you quickly. Let me just change slides. Uh, there we go. Um, so that augmented light lab file you can download. And we actually did try and put that model into augmented. Um, everything worked except for Susan's hair for some reason. Uh, augmented doesn't like hair, uh, so Susan was feeling very bald, uh, very bald at the table, and that didn't. That felt like it was telling a completely different story. Um, so that was actually a capture file that we used for that. Um, what's the next one that makes sense? Uh, Leah has, uh, has more of a, a comment that I think is really valid to what you were saying there, which is um, that, that he sometimes cheats and the directors that he works with aren't very good at describing things. So he asks them to bring pictures um, of what they're imagining. And I think that, yeah. that, you know, and several people have been complimenting you despite me telling them not to, um, <laughs> that, uh, that, that the way that you are verbalizing what you are describing or trying to achieve um, is, is better than most um and you know it pains me to say it uh so <laughs> i i think that the you know verbalizing visual things is very hard particularly if you're not from a, a lighting perspective um or, or even your know, photography and film background so, so visual references are very useful um and the the kind of the observed thing is is something that if you've ever been involved in photography or, or filmmaking as well i spend my time wandering around looking at everything wondering how that shot was taken where it was lit from what they might be using what colors um so yeah it's it's a curse understanding lighting um question from julia when you are doing a focus do you prefer to do it alone or do you prefer to have a couple of assistants and when you're focusing alone what tools do you use to assist you in making sure that your light cover is even and what you want hmm. um i'll be honest and say that it's been a long time since i've had to focus anything alone um but that said sometimes i do actually prefer focusing alone uh because it can be quicker um, so I'm not often, um, I, I do a fair amount of work in uh, student environments and sometimes you, uh, something gets lost in translation. And even, even when you're sort of on tour and you're, you know, you're working in different countries and different languages, something I find can sometimes get lost in translation. So that can uh, sometimes slow the process down while you're sort of explaining, oh, no, I didn't mean bigger, I meant longer or, you know, bad, bad example. Um, so but but where possible i would try and have assistance and ideally i like the assistant to be someone who works at the venue and someone who's going to be on the show uh where possible so preferably uh whoever's going to be operating the show uh for the run uh should be there in the focus because if they know how everything has been focused uh you've got a pretty good chance that they will be able to reset the focus uh if it gets bumped or they have to do a gel change or a lamp change 
Um, of course, those are all things that are slowly becoming things of the past. Um, or something gets knocked with a piece of scenery. Um, uh, you know, so, so I, I find having someone who's going to stay with the show uh, helping is is hugely advantageous. Um, if that doesn't happen, I try and find the time to take pictures, uh, individual, so from the production desk position, take a photograph of the whole stage, you include everything uh, light by light. So they've got a sort of photographic reference of uh, where each light is focused. Um, if, it's, if it's a show that's going to sit down for any length of time or go on tour, there will normally be a bit more some documentation attached to it than that. Um, but but at, at the sort of very least, I try and at least leave somebody with a set of photographs. A question from Robbie. What would be your recommendation of distribution of colour or gel in the ideal plan, the three-point side light, that sort of thing? What's warm, what's cool, what's darker, what's more saturated, and why, in your opinion? Um, so I would tend to, I don't know why, but I tend to always put the warm... Uh, coming in from uh, stage right, so house left side. I don't know why. That's always my sort of instinct until I sort of step back and have a look at it and go, hmm, is that right for this piece? And then I might sort of shake it up a little bit. Um, it's, it's, it's a sort of personal preference. A, a lot of it comes down to the story I'm telling, which side I've chosen as east or west, if if it's that kind of piece. Um, if if there's no real rhyme or reason for which side the color needs to come from, then I tend to do warm from from right. I don't know why. That's just something that's crept up and just sort of stayed with me. Um, my more saturated colors tend to be my back and side and top lights, largely because they don't have a big effect on on skin tone. If they're going to be really saturated, I try and always keep them uh, as as a backlight. Um, yeah, it's a, a lot of it. What, what I what I try very hard to do is not fall into the trap, having just said what I've said, to try to not fall into the trap of having a style and having a sort of fallback plan that I always go to. Uh, some designers have got a sort of basic sort of plot that they keep and they'll just make a few little tweaks and then issue that. I, I try not to. I, I try very much to offer something unique and bespoke to each show. Um, so where possible, I'll try and shake things up. But my, my more saturated colors tend to be in backlight uh, and the paler tints tend to be from the front. Um, I try and do, where possible, I'll try and do a 45 degree system. If not from the front, then the sort of lower down side option. Uh, but if I am locked into the front, if my warm comes in from that side, what I will do at somewhere is I will have a corresponding cool coming in. So at least if I need to cool things down a little bit, I do have something from the other side um, that'll do that job for me. Um, a question that I'm going to open up to the, the floor for people to kind of comment in, because I think this is more of a US thing. Um, where can one buy fabricated focus tape? Ooh. Uh, does Lamarck still do that? I don't know. But yeah, so if, if, if anybody um, on the call knows that answer, feel free to type it in as a question, just so we can pass that on. Um, yeah, I, I've never had to buy it, actually, so I don't really know. Um, there is a tape manufacturer in the UK called Lamarck. I don't know if they're global. They may be. Um, I believe they have some. Um, trying to think of the name of the company in the states who does it my mind's gone blank but there, there, there is a, a a a tape supplier in the states who, who i know does something like that um but the the the, the name eludes me my short one what are your thoughts on Hayes? love it no Hayes, no tony um but again <laughs> Uh, everything obviously has to be used uh, in moderation and if it's right for the piece. Um, haze is not always right for everything. Uh, haze is a great way of sort of, sometimes it can draw attention to the lighting, which which may or may not be what you want. Uh, it can sometimes very much help with focus. Uh, a nice strong shaft of light coming through a window looks so much better when there's a little bit of haze in the air. Uh, the trick for me is getting a good haze on stage. Uh, so you don't just have 
what looks to be a little sort of steamer puffing away in the corner somewhere. Uh, getting that real even distribution of haze on the stage uh, is important and it's difficult to do um, because somebody opens a door somewhere or the aircon changes or kicks in or somebody sneezes in the front row and I find it changes the way the haze behaves. So it's, it's tricky, but uh, if I have a choice, haze is normally up there as, as, as being one of the things that is part of my design. A uh, follow-up question to, to one of the earlier ones. Um, can you explain what fabricated focus tape is for? Sure. So uh, basically a fabricated focus tape is basically a tape that it's a sort of tape that looks like a tape measure really and it's got sort of meter or foot markings on it depending which version you've got and you would run that down on the stage uh, across the front uh, and probably a center strip and strips up the side just to give you sort of reference points so that when you're making your focus notes you can say that light number one focuses downstage from the five meter mark to the three meter mark and as far as upstage as the two and a half meter mark so it gives you uh, a, a sort of means of of documenting quite accurately with measurements how the lights are going to be focused that's normally something that's done if they're expecting the show to go on tour quite a lot uh, and the sort of focus is going to need to be repeated again and again and again um, what we've done in the poll what we used to do i haven't seen it done in a long time um, but we used to tour with what we call a focus cloth or a grid cloth so we would actually have a huge piece of cloth just a sort of light piece of muslin or calico um, that was the footprint of the stage. So we would rig everything. Uh, and so the show would be rigged, focused and, and lit. And then before we take it out, we fly the lighting bars down to a sort of one meter trim height, turn them on. And on this cloth, we actually draw the shape of where that light beam falls on the cloth and any sort of other information in that circle. So when we get to the next venue, rig the lights, plug them in, set the trim to a meter, turn them on, and you have to line them up with their corresponding circles on the grid cloth take the bar out of trim and the rigs focused. Uh, so that's another quick, easy way to, uh, to sort of do on, uh, on the road focuses. Uh, Thomas, and this, this one is going to make me smile as I read it. What do you think about directors who make the light themselves or about set designers who wants to be lighting designers? And I say that with a smile because that's Declan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can hardly comment because I guess I'm a lighting designer who's also done some set design. Um, do you know what? I think, hmm, <laughs> yeah, that is a tricky one. Um, I, I think it's great. I think if, if people have enough knowledge um, to be able to make those choices, uh, I, I think it's great. For me, though, if you're going to call yourself a lighting designer, you must be able to produce a lighting plan. You must be able to converse with your programmer in a way that they're going to be able to understand, excuse me. Um, it's the same as if, if you, if you were a choreographer, there are certain things I would expect you to be able to do. And I, and I think it's, it, it works the same way. Um, where I think it's, it's, it's a gray area is where the director will rely on the in-house technician to basically have come up with the rig and the design and they sort of just talk them through the programming and then take the credits. Yes, yeah, a bit of a gray area there. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, I've also directed and I'm sure that upset a whole lot of people as well. So I can't really comment because I don't think there's any problem with having uh, a number of strings to your bow. Um, Joseph is asking, have you worked in venues where front light couldn't come from a front of house position and needed to come from over stage? And do you have any tips for this? Uh, yeah, there are there. Absolutely. And certainly in some of the, the, the older theatres in, in London, front of house positions just didn't exist. Um, and, you know, you have the option, you can suspend a piece of truss coming in from the front, but it sometimes becomes uh, tricky to focus. Um, because you can't get ladder access, everything has to be moving light, so that starts having impact on budgets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, in venues where you don't have front of house positions, uh, there is norm there'll normally be box boom uh, positions or sort of slot positions in the side of the auditorium. So basically, that then steers the decision. So instead of coming from the, the front forty five, it tends to be the side forty five angle. Um, so you just make that modification. And again, I would still divide the stage into areas. And I would still light from the side area one, area two, area three, area one, area two, area three. The angle, the angle of the fixture changes slightly, um, 
but not too drastically. Um, so yeah, it, it happens, you, you'll get there. And it just means that you, you change your, your approach slightly. Um, sometimes you may want to then in that case, if there is a, a circle rail or a balcony rail, you might want to consider putting something on there that'll just help to get rid of any horrible shadows to keep them at low levels, but it'll sort of fill any, any holes that might exist. Um, yeah, it, it, it sort of, it sometimes the, the, the venue makes those choices for you. Um, and you kind of just have to, have to sort of roll with it. Uh, when I started out as a lighting designer, I, I used to panic a lot. You'd, you know, you come to venues, no front of house, and you're like, oh, what am I going to do? Or the set designer's got mirrors everywhere, and you're like, oh, the floor is white, or whatever it was. And I find the more you do it, the less I'm sort of uh, bothered by that kind of stuff. I'm like, oh, all right, the walls are white and the floor's white. Well, okay, oh, there's a ceiling. Nah, okay, whatever. We'll just and you and you just adjust and you and you just you 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 do the best you can with with what you've got. Sure. I think that's most of the questions that we've had. Oh, and I've had some more coming in. Um, I will just kind of dip back to, to something that Ashley added when we were talking about um, communicating with directors about your plot and what you're planning. Um, the, the suggestion was was that um, Adolf Apa used to come to mind um, and they, they used to use uh, those photos to um, present directors with inspirational ideas. Uh, but the directors would often get bogged down on the image itself as opposed to the lovely dusty stream of sunlight coming in through the window that you're trying to get them to talk about they would be more interested in well i don't want the room to look like that mm. um but yes i i think that you know it, it's a very difficult thing to talk about um, it is a very difficult thing to talk about and that's one of the reasons why i'm always visualizers for my personal use of fine i'm always nervous to use to present a visualizer to a director um because the colors don't necessarily render all that accurately. Um, and sometimes they can get used to an idea on uh, of an image that you've shown them that you actually, maybe it turns out in the theater that it doesn't actually quite work for whatever reason. And then you sort of talk to yourself into a bit of a corner. Um, so yeah, uh, it happens, but I think most, most times you can, you, you, you can normally uh, get yourself out of those sort of uh, situations. Um, I don't think we've actually mentioned it in this uh, this session. Um, these webinars are based on this poster series. You can see the thumbnails of. Um, there is a book in booklet. It's not. Let's not kid ourselves. It's not a book. Uh, there's a booklet in its final stages of uh, of editing um, as well. So uh, this is kind of based on the content of that, which is why we are we're interested to know if there is appetite for us to be doing more of these. Um, we do. We've been really happy with the response, so thank you all for attending. Um, so we'll be exploring, kind of formalizing what we've done over the last few weeks uh, a little bit more. Um, I think that is everything that has come through. Uh, lots of suggestions on, on how people are making up focus tape, either by buying fabric measuring tape and, and sharpieing on them or um, similar kind of, of things of, of either taping stuff out with a measuring tape beforehand and focusing to it or, or it's, customizing it's, in in this day and age of us being sort of environmentally aware and trying to be as as green and as carbon neutral as possible having something that is reusable uh is probably a better way to go uh as opposed to having something that you're going to sort of peel up and throw away at the end of each uh focus session Phil's just asked, any tips for integrating follow spots into production? Why not to use them? Uh, I, I love a good follow spot. Um, and, 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 and I put the word good in there. Um, I'm not a big fan unless it's the style of the show of the sort of traditional, you know, quite low angle and follow spot angles tend to be quite low. They're about 30 degrees. Um, quite sort of low front light you know, sort of follow spot for me is 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 less interesting. They, they are a great way of they're sort of movable specials, really, aren't they? Um, so, you know, if, if, if you need to pick people out uh, that are sort of moving around, they're, they're a great way to do that. Um, I'm a big fan of using beam lights as follow spots. I think we chatted about those in, in session two. Um, and then I tend to sort of bring them up to a slightly steeper angle. So it's slightly more dramatic. But again, that's that's a style choice. It it doesn't work for everything. 
Um, but yeah, I, I don't have a problem with follow spots. The, the big thing for me with follow spots is uh, you are absolutely at the mercy of your follow spot operators. Uh, if, you, if you're doing a show and there's some bad sound, uh, so a microphone is, is late or there's feedback or the speaker crackles or whatever it is, everybody notices. The audience picks that up straight away. There's very little. In fact, there's probably nothing that an audience will notice about lighting. You can have a blackout somewhere where there wasn't supposed to be and pop the lights back on and most of your audience doesn't actually notice. The one thing they do notice when it goes wrong is bad follow spotting to the point that it actually becomes a gag. And that's obviously what you don't want. So you are absolutely at the mercy of your of your operators. Um, but if you've got good operators and good equipment, uh, I have no problems in 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 putting spots spots into shows at all. Uh, and in fact, what's something that's becoming quite popular um, if you're running on the EOS uh, system is people are starting to put pucks up in the follow spot booth uh, networked into the system and on their screen, they just have their dedicated cue sheet um, so that, you know, that they're all tied into the lighting system. So as the lighting operator is running through the queues, their cue sheet is also advancing through the show. Uh, and I think that's a great way to sort of start integrating technology and getting spots uh, into the shows and sort of killing two birds with one stone. So as you're lighting, you're also just getting those spot cues uh, loaded in as part of the show content at the same time. I, I think also I'll add into the fact that, you know, as this is aimed as a, a beginner's guide, um, getting the job of being a follow spotter is an incredibly great way to get into lighting because um, you spend your entire time on headset listening to people with more experience than you um, and you, you know, having an appreciation of what the lighting designer might be trying to achieve when they give you your cues, um, they'll really appreciate the fact that you want to learn no more. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's a great way through. We, um, we recently launched a, uh, a podcast series that we're calling On Headset, um, the first set of which is called The Billington Files. Um, it, it's kind of it's been designed as a a way for high level EOS programmers to kind of challenge themselves. Uh, and the concept is we've we've taken a recording of a, a lighting designer Ken Billington um, and his lighting team as they they work through technical rehearsal. And the idea is to see if you can keep up with a a top level lighting designer. And um, starting out as follow spot operator is a way to achieve this without. Um, without getting, you know, lost behind Ken Billington um, or, you know, that sort of access is a really great way to kind of ingratiate yourself with your local lighting team. Um, and, you know, everyone's looking for, as long as you're nice and interested. Um, loads of people are asking me for the link for the Billington file, so I will now dig it up while, uh, while Declan talks about it. <laughs> um, yeah, so the Billington file, uh, just to continue on that, is uh, the first of what we're hoping is going to be a series. Um, we were fortunate enough to record Ken Billington lighting me and my girl. Uh, and the series is called On Headset. And I see Rory's just posted the link now. It's now um, in the, the chat channel for everyone. It's on the homepage of the, the main ETC website as well. Yeah. Uh, and, and they're great. We're, getting, we're slowly going to add more designers in from all around the world, from different countries, doing different styles. Uh, and it'll be a great way for you to, to sort of practice your, your sort of programming chops. Perfect. Well, I think that's all of the questions that have, have come in. Well, thank you very um, thank much, you everybody. Um, um, it's been... Particularly well done if you've attended all four sessions. And uh, if you haven't, the other three are on YouTube and this one will appear shortly. Great. Thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day.